Tenakoto Kato, it's great to be here. I like being introduced as not from the glam sector. I think I've only been out of the glam sector for about three years, but it does seem like quite a long time. Uh, so nice to step back and uh, be here with a, a room full of highly creative, charming, uh, connected people. Not that I'm trying to say anything about statisticians with that. Um, so I'm going to share a bit of what I've been thinking about over the last year, um, talk about uh, some of the things that have already been highlighted at this conference, uh, the change that's happening in the world of data, uh, and then tell you about the, the Data Futures Forum and what it has done. Beautiful. It works. <coughs> so data is a great field to be working in right now. Data is the new black. What steam was to the 19th century, oil to the 20th, data is to the 21st, or so we're told. Actually, my chief executive, who's only been with us for about a year, uh, was really keen to get a t-shirt, nice black one, data is the new black. Um, chief executives are keen on it, ministers are keen on it, the United Nations is keen. Um, there's a whole focus in this area. It's seen as driving the engine of the economy, enabling social development, for example, with the Arab Spring. Um, how's this manifesting right now? Rick Ellis already mentioned the increase in the flow of data and communication over the last five years or so. So McKinsey would say an increase sevenfold from 2008 to 2013. More data produced every 15 days currently than before 2003. 44 times more data expected in 2020 than there was in 2009. I quite like these numbers because I'm not sure if they're actually accurate or, or what they mean, um, but uh, tend to be used often. Um, and I think if you're sitting on the heritage side, you'd be thinking, well, you know, we were talking about a digital deluge already back in the 1990s and the 2000s. Uh, this is a, a trend that's grown over time from early computers in the, in the 50s and 60s to relational databases in the 70s and 80s. But uh, as Rick was just saying, Privacy Acts from 93, Official Information Acts from 82, Statistics Act, bless it, from 1975. Uh, are we keeping up? Right now, buzzword of the year, uh, the internet of everything, or the internet of things. According to Cisco, internet of everything is what happens when you combine the internet of everyone with the internet of things. Um, right now, they're estimating 50 billion connected things or devices, uh, with 99% of things not yet connected, presenting massive potential. Uh, so Cisco are predicting $14.4 trillion of private sector value is at stake globally over the 10 years from 2013 to 2022. Uh, what do they mean by Internet of Things? Smart devices equipped with sensors connected through the Internet. Probably pretty much everyone here has a smartphone. Does anyone not have a smartphone? Aw, oh, bless. <laughs> um, coming up next, smart cars driverless cars. I'm quite looking forward to a self-driving car. Um, smart houses, the house that knows when you're coming home, what temperature you would like it to be, what time you get up in the morning, helps to wake you up in a, in a pleasant way. Um, smart fridges, uh, they know when the milk's run out, they order it for you from the supermarket, they adjust to based on the seasons. Um, so we're creating this connected web of sensors and devices that are talking not just to us, but to one another. That wouldn't have been possible without a whole set of previous trends, mobile, cloud, Wi-Fi, globally compatible uh, connectivity, particularly SIM cards, sensors, seven of those per smartphone for the uh, bulk of you who do have them, uh, and big data and analytics. Big data um, used to be a bit of a curse word in my team at Archives. I had one uh, great staff member who would uh, yeah, swear every time big data was mentioned. Um, she'll be pleased to hear that's reached the peak of the Gartner hype cycle and is now heading down into the trough of disillusionment before moving into business as usual. Um, the Internet of Things, on the other hand, is right up there uh, this year. Data science moving up fast. So what are some of those aspects of Internet of Things? The quantified self is one. Uh, so how many people have downloaded a, a fitness or health app onto their smartphone, tablet or computer? Yeah, not too bad, maybe half the room. 
How many are trying wearable technology? So Fitbits, some bands. How many want the Apple Watch when it comes out? Yeah, not that many. I think it looks kind of cool, you know, matches your outfit. Um, very popular technology already uh, elsewhere. So over in California, straight after the, the Napa Valley earthquake a couple of months ago, visualizations were appearing up in the web showing the disruption to sleep patterns within a certain radius from the epicenter of the quake based on Fitbit and personal wearable um, health data. Um, they're, they're, that ability to provide self-knowledge, uh, both knowledge of things that you might have thought you wanted to know, my heart rate, how many steps have I taken, um, and things that you really didn't even know existed in your own biometrics. Uh, track my cortisol levels, sequence my DNA, see what microbial cells inhabit my body. Um, yeah, remarkable. Uh, possible uses, I guess there's benefits at the individual level, that's why people are, are choosing wearables, including wearables in the form of glasses and shirts uh, in, the, in the sports world. Um, so you can improve your own health by knowing what's going on with it, eating healthily, improving your activity levels, monitoring your surroundings. You can also crowdsource outcomes for several million other people, prevent a stroke before it happens by monitoring what's going on with your body in communication with your physician. We could enable health research, track an epidemic, see what's happening with a public health issue, uh, measure the impact of an event such as an earthquake. We could match that data with the data that's held in public sector health data stores and see what's happened over time for communities. Uh, but pretty tricky territory when it comes to privacy and how much it's really healthy to know. Another huge area of development is smart cities. Um, back when we had the, the Napier earthquakes in the 1930s, we, we lost a city and we rebuilt it with the technology that was considered most modern at that time. So beautiful art deco architecture, placing all of our electricity cables underground, partly to prevent risk, partly to create a, a cleaner city environment, uh, wider roads, better for cars. We've got the same opportunity in Christchurch, and there there's the opportunity to lead in the, in the creation of a sensing city for the future um, in the way that, that cities overseas have been developing. Uh, so people down there are thinking, how can we install sensors in the new infrastructure? How can we create a connected city? And it's already underway. Uh, so the cat's eyes that will be installed on the roads in Christchurch, can they monitor the temperature? Can they look at the air pollution? Can they tell you exactly where you need grit in the winter? Uh, how much traffic has passed by? What the impact on the road is of that? Uh, what's happening with earthquakes, with aftershocks? Where are the impacts strongest around town? Um, asthma inhalers with sensors attached being given uh, to people who suffer from that condition um, are already tracking back to the, the hospital service and telling them how much medicine is being dosed out and where so that they can see what's going on with dust and pollution. Imagine if you could take that and extend it to Auckland, apply it to some of our biggest transport problems nationwide. Uh, here in Wellington, uh, they're talking about using sensing lights, slightly easier and less intensive to install, already in place if you weren't aware in major airports. If you're traveling through London Heathrow or through Newark, the lights can see who you are, see what you're doing, see what your temperature is. Wellington cities thinking maybe in suburban areas we could head in that direction. We'd be able to know when the, to turn the lights on, what's happening with traffic, who's moving from an area of the city, and it would be relatively straightforward to install. Primary industries. It's my chance to use the word datafication. It's one of my, one of my new favourites of the year. Uh, datafication brought to New Zealand by Josh Feast uh, when he was out back in April. Uh, is this pattern of attaching devices and smarts uh, to things that, that previously uh, you wouldn't have associated with them. Uh, so can we create an information industry that produces cows? Uh, yes, actually it's already underway. Silverfern Farms have been trialling it on several hundred of uh, the farms that they work with, tracking what's happening with the animals, tracking the other activities that go on around the animals, what's going on the pasture, what's the temperature, where should we irrigate, which animals receive which medicine, uh, how's their weight going, what's happening uh, with different parts of production. Uh, Ministry of Primary Industries is looking at producing something called SmartMark, which would connect across a, a wide range of primary industries in order to meet compliance requirements in overseas markets, uh, but also to get a value add 
on New Zealand's product. Um, if we can show that it came from this charmingly green farm somewhere in New Zealand and not from this nasty factory farm elsewhere, um, can we justify charging more for our product and shipping it that far? So PricewaterhouseCoopers put out a report this September that estimated that data-driven innovation added 67 billion to the Australian economy in 2013 alone. That would make up 4.4% of GDP, not insignificant. Um, that every sector in their economy is using data to grow, from agriculture to health to mining. Um, but that there's substantial further room for growth. Uh, so they were estimating 48 billion unrealized potential just in 2013. Uh, it's been a big area of emphasis at the World Economic Forum in Davos over the past five years or so, and it's been picked up by the United Nations at global level when they're looking at sustainable development. Uh, so now we've got terms like data philanthropy, data without borders, data for development, how do we connect the data scientists with people that need that capability, how do we connect uh, the people that need the data with rich data sources. Um, Ban Ki-moon set up an international experts advisory group on the data revolution uh, back in September, ran an online consultation in October, um, released this report a few weeks ago. Uh, really interesting to see how that's connected to some of the things that we've been doing in New Zealand. So here, Bill English, big driver um, of this agenda, um, and having come back in, uh, with renewed vigour, determination and enthusiasm uh, to achieve things within the, the uh, three-year window that our politicians have, um, is now pushing uh, hard alongside a set of other senior ministers uh, to see data used to drive results, uh, particularly results for uh, Kiwis in need, uh, so drive better social outcomes. Uh, from his perspective as Minister of Finance, uh, what improves outcomes for individuals and families, reduces the government's bottom line, so there's an economic incentive to do it. So the three areas uh, that ministers are focusing on that we've seen really strongly um, since the 20th of September uh, around data use, uh, using data to decide where to focus. Uh, how do we make evidence-based policy, evidence-based decisions? How do we identify priorities? How do we measure what's working? And by implication, what's not? And stop doing the things that are not working. Um, they've uh, put out a call for the private sector, for frontline service workers, for NGOs to come and give ideas to Treasury about what they would do uh, to solve those problems better. Uh, second uh, key area of emphasis, who to invest in. Which individuals will benefit most from social services investment if we focus on teen mums? Can we change the outcomes for their children? Um, should we be generalist? Should we be specific? Um, third, and closely related, is frontline decision making. Uh, so they've shifted from talking about big data to talking about small data, joined up to enable people oriented frontline services rather than services restricted to silos. Um, this is partly enabled by the integrated data infrastructure, which I manage at Statistics New Zealand. It's been building up progressively over the last 10 years or so, managed under the tight restrictions of the Stats Act, uh, so anonymised, uh, fully confidentialised before anything's released. A uh, strong focus on privacy and security, uh, but in there uh, we've got tax data related to um, a fair proportion of our 4.5 million New Zealanders. We can look at your employment, look at your earnings. That's connected through to benefits data from MSD, uh, to education data from primary, secondary, tertiary. Uh, we're just bringing in the first tranche of health data from seven of the nine national health collections. Uh, we've got migration and movements data, an immensely powerful resource for finding out what's happening with the population and which services are delivering which results. This one's still relatively unreadable, even on such a magnificently large screen. Uh, but uh, this is demonstrating what it looks like in the social sector, uh, using Marky e. Smith as a pseudonym. Uh, so uh, how do you focus on the outcomes and on the people uh, rather than on the service silos? Uh, right now, each of these horizontal lines uh, sits relatively separate in our systems because we've built them 
partly around legacy digital, partly around service and departmental silos, partly around privacy and security. Um, that means that the education system won't necessarily know what's going on uh, for a mark with child protection, uh, which abuse findings there have been. Um, the correction system may not know um, about the, the stints that Mark had in care uh, through social development. Um, income support may not be aware of the educational outcome. Um, this one's painting a, a pretty um, representative picture of the, the misery that hits some parts of the population in New Zealand. Uh, so what happens if you grow up in poverty, um, you have a pretty poor start in life, uh, we've managed to, to get you into the education system. You've actually done a bit of uh, NCEA level two and tertiary. Um, that hasn't helped too much with your course. You've ended up in the prison system. Um, cumulative cost for one individual, um, heading over 200,000 by the age of 20. Um, this is the, the type of investment view that the Minister of Finance is particularly interested in. So who owns all this data? Rick's given us some uh, sense of the, the complications that happen when you try and look at it from a legal angle. Um, but for the it's about 10 of you that had the Fitbit going on, you know, you're wearing that device, it's harvesting up to an app on your phone. Chances are the app's being run by a company overseas. Is it them that now own the data about your heart rate? Um, what's going on with your cortisol levels? Uh, whether you went for a run today or not. Um, how many people bought a coffee on the way in this morning? Yeah, so more than with the health devices, typical. Um, <laughs> when you bought the coffee, when you ordered your, your, your trim mochaccino large size takeout, um, is it the barista that owns the content of that transaction? Is it yourself because you ordered it? Is it the person who was standing behind you in the queue who happened to notice? Oh, there's a lot of people ordering those at the moment. That could be useful commercial information. Um, if the um, coffee machine was, was hooked up to the internet and running as a smart device uh, connected back to the um, wholesaler, is it them that own it? Um, very hard to define. Uh, much easier to focus on use rights than ownership rights, which gets quite fascinating if data is such a strong commodity. So, back at the beginning of 2014, um, Bill English and the Minister of Statistics established the New Zealand Data Futures Forum to look at the potential of data and also to think about the challenges, the risks, and promote a more realistic public debate. Uh, he um, specifically requested a mix of people, private sector, public sector, an independent chair, uh, so this is what he got uh, for his money. Um, and a focus on future possibilities. Uh, so uh, direct running instructions, uh, not to be afraid uh, to stir up some debate, uh, to get in there, to think about things, to be forward leaning uh, rather than overly conservative. Um, so the forum um, set out on its adaptive journey, producing three reports along the way. Um, the first of them focused on the benefits, opportunities, risks and challenges. Uh, the second, articulating a, a path forward, and the third, putting in place a, a set of recommendations for things that the country could do. Uh, so on that benefits side, we've talked around that quite a bit already, uh, but everything from competitive advantage for New Zealand, if existing industries are going to go, how do we move forward? Uh, how do we make sure that our industries are, are well placed uh, to get their share of the pie uh, in an innovative, data-driven environment internationally. Uh, how do we become the Switzerland of data? Is it possible? Uh, we've got the only uh, Privacy Act in the Asia Pacific region that's accredited as adequate. Uh, we're ranked number one in Transparency International's index for lack of corruption. Uh, so. You know, we're not too bad compared to other countries. There should be some advantage in that for us. Um, it also um, spelled out some of the, the opportunities around better public services, better places to live, work and play, transformation of everyday life, and open and transparent government. And then talked about the challenges, risks, and tensions. So I think on this side, 
privacy is usually um, first to come to mind. It's the, the how do we avoid any more cock-ups? Uh, what happened with ACC? What happened with EQC? Are we really that bad? Uh, so I think on that side, it's really um, mistakes uh, that lead to lack of trust and confidence and potential harm for individuals. Uh, but there's also cases out there of invasive use, malicious use, um, marketing that, that can range from the merely annoying to um, quite disruptive um, target. Actually, John Whitehead, who chaired the forum, visited the US while we were working and um, stopped in at the White House to talk to the people working on their big data and privacy 90-day task force. They were saying that retailers uh, say they can identify the ethnicity of a person based on one purchase. Oh, God. I don't know which thing it is that I'm purchasing that would show that. Um, but uh, Target got in trouble a year or so back uh, with the, the father of a 15 or 16 year old girl uh, for sending uh, stuff to the house that was promoting um, baby materials, things to help you out in pregnancy. My daughter's not pregnant, you've got to stop this, you've got it all wrong. Um, had to sneak back and apologize a few months later. Hmm, things going on that we hadn't realized. <laughs> based on the purchase of a hand cream. Uh, so <laughs> Snowden, uh, NSA, people's worries about GCSB, about intelligence and metadata uh, fall into this space as well. Uh, Big Brother, what is the borderline between the state and the citizen? How comfortable are we if our data is being used for particular purposes that government uh, believe strongly are, are in the public good, but that some individuals uh, may see as not in that category. Uh, from a Māori perspective, when they look at a diagram like this, um, the first reaction is, well, you're going to use that to risk profile who's going to fall into that category and then target those kids. Is ethnicity going to be one of the variables? Uh, because normally it's one of the predictors of poor outcomes. What does that mean for how you're going to handle our kids? So the forum went out on the road. We talked to New Zealanders, we talked to government, we talked to business, to academics, to non-governmental organisations, to Māori, uh, to people working in the data innovation space. A pretty whistle-stop um, tour over the top, given the short time frame. But a number of consistent themes came through. Privacy. How much of my information does the government have? What are you doing with it? How do I know about that? On the flip side, often from the same people, access. There should be free access to all government data. Um, you guys should set up a website that shows me where I can go to get the government data. Oh, pretty sure we did that. It's probably about five, six years ago. Um, clearly not that high a profile. Um, the digital divide. Uh, both in the sense of lack of access to technology, but even more so uh, lack of skills to navigate privacy, lack of skills to use data, lack of access to high-level infrastructure um, and technology in order to run your own data. Um, thinking of iwi and uh, non-governmental organisations in that bracket. Uh, we also heard a huge amount about opportunities, uh, about capability that the country wants to build, and quite a lot of concern about data sovereignty. So people are thinking about the risks of Facebook, of Google, of LinkedIn, um, of the agreements that only 25% of people uh, say that they look at before they tick the box, um, and I'm sure they can't possibly read all of it. Uh, so in that second paper, the forum set out a path to navigate our data future with four guiding principles to take us forward so that we can harness the benefits of data use safely. Those principles were value, that New Zealand should use data to drive economic and social value, get on with it, get the competitive advantage from data, treat data as a strategic asset, encourage collaboration and sharing, support creativity and innovation, and promote our unique data use ecosystem in New Zealand and overseas. Uh, but you'll only get the benefit of that if you also have inclusion. Um, all New Zealanders, communities and businesses should be enabled to adapt and thrive in this new environment. Um, you'll need trust, transparency, openness, privacy, security um, and accountable stewardship of data. And we need a higher level of individual control, even if the legal rights are there already. Uh, people should be able to determine the level of privacy that they desire 
based on improved insight into how their personal data is being processed and used. Um, informed consent should be simple, easy to understand, not full of legalese, and people should have enhanced rights to opt out to correct. Uh, they're there in the law, how much we're giving them in practice. If we could get those four things working in sync, uh, we reckon you could create a pretty positive feedback loop in a, a trusted data use ecosystem uh, that if people felt that they were included in the benefits, that they could trust, that they had some control over things, then they'd think, well, it's pretty safe to share. I think I'll give you some more of my data. From that, we'd derive enhanced value. People would think, well, yeah, no, that's good. Let's keep going with that. Uh, so it's a, a recipe uh, for success. We also talked about which brackets different data fits in and what's appropriate to do for different organisations. I think this one we didn't quite nail. It's just not direct enough, too complicated. Uh, but if you replace the wording in the top left-hand quadrant with something like coercive data harvesting um, and think that taking it without my permission, they're using it to target me, uh, we think there are a small set of functions uh, that deserve to be in that category. Uh, that's where crime prevention sits. Uh, that's where we're uh, protecting individuals that need protection, uh, trying to stop child abuse, uh, trying to uh, support the elderly. Uh, but that in most cases, even in government, we should be moving out of that quadrant. Uh, we should be getting either across to the right, where the individual has the right to choose, and ask them, is it OK uh, if we take your data and mash it up with some data over here, because then we could give you this better service offering, um, or shift down um, into that section where data is not used to target a particular person. Um, so that's where um, anonymised data, like the integrated data infrastructure, would sit. Um, a lot of the, the data that we're talking about um, doesn't have to identify people. Um, even Stephen England Hall from Loyalty New Zealand, who was on the forum, was saying, well, you know, we can do everything we want in terms of marketing without knowing that it's Mark. Uh, we just need to know it's a guy of a certain age, really likes red wine, uh, has an interest in football. Let's uh, send these things to that address. Um, if it's cows that you're tagging, there are no privacy implications in it. Get on with it. At least not yet. Maybe that's coming. What do you think? The third paper that the forum issued set out a quite lengthy series of recommendations and three clusters. Uh, so the big headlines were get the rules of the game right. How do we make sure uh, that we've got the right protections when we're living in a technology fast, data fast, law slow environment? Uh, we need to be agile, to be responsive, uh, to be effective, uh, to keep ahead of the, the curve with our regulation. Um, so the suggestion there was to have an independent group of wise heads and experts who represent different uh, communities in New Zealand advising uh, government and data users on the ethics of data use. What should we be doing uh, about uh, people's digital legacy after they die? Uh, what should we be doing in terms of social sector data sharing? I think the latest question that came up when I got independent privacy advice on IDI was how will you decide whether to put New Zealand's genome in there or not, Evelyn? I thought, yeah, no, it'd be really good to have that independent separate group uh, on questions like that. That sounds pretty gnarly and apparently uh, is not far off in terms of developments in the health sector. Um, second up in that area, review the legislation. Um, so it's pretty common sense that if you've got a whole set of legislation developed before we moved into this information environment, uh, that we could do better if we had something that was focused on the, uh, the information environment that we live in now and that's more coherent. Second cluster, create value by doing. Be iterative, be agile, get on with it, get some projects underway, act fast with them, uh, fail fast if they don't work, and learn from what you're doing. Um, so Andy will be pleased to hear this. There's a little bubble on the lower right there called making the most of research data. Uh, research and science data in New Zealand is pretty underserved. Uh, we've got a, a big asset sitting in that area that we're not making maximum use of, particularly if it's publicly funded. Let's get on, uh, make it more available, uh, manage it better. 
pull it together in ways that create new knowledge, uh, but also in this area, uh, focus on primary industries, on using data and sharing it to empower Māori, on uh, data from the, the natural and built environment, um, and some great suggestions of projects that uh, are already underway or could be created in there that will bring together non-governmental organisations, private sector and government. Um, third, once you've got that progress and you've got the rules right, you need sustainable foundations. We need to look at how we grow the next generation of data scientists so that we're not short 1,200 people uh, within the next five years, which is the, the figure that uh, Curious at Spark were using when they set up earlier this year. Uh, we need to incentivise innovation. Uh, we need to raise the public's level of understanding and awareness. Uh, we need to make sure that privacy, security and regulation are, are built into our systems. Um, and um, there's a big niche market growing up in that individual control space. So a lot of companies getting up and running that sell themselves as personal information management bring together uh, the strands of your information and help you to control it better. Uh, so look for some innovation on that side. I was having a wee think before coming here about what all of this means for the glam sector, and you're probably better placed to answer it uh, than me. I think NDF, you've been focused on digital for years now. Um, is this just more of the same? Is it something different? Um, perhaps for institutions, there are three options. Um, so there's one about sit back and let others take the lead. I was thinking in terms of digital detox, which has become quite the thing this year, uh, retro nostalgia. Not me, I'm not going on Facebook, I'm not having a smartphone. Um, yeah, when I was living in Paris, just down the road, there was a little shop that specialised in umbrella repairs. Well, that's completely anachronistic and awful, but it's really quite charming and nice as well. Um, could, a, could a traditional gallery, museum or library provide a haven of respite from the world of digital? Um, could you be brave enough to, to um, do like the Otago Museum's done and keeping its natural history display looking like something from the 19th century? Say, so actually, we're partly memorialising where we've come from uh, as well as looking at the future. Uh, I guess the other thing that would drive you in this space is uh, being conservative, uh, being too worried about privacy, being too worried about copyright, being too worried about resources, not being willing to shift from resourcing one thing to another. Um, if you sit back, let others take the lead, uh, chances are that if there's an opportunity, someone else is going to take it. Uh, maybe that you become one of those closed shop fronts on Oxford Street. Second option would be improve. So this is in the continuous improvement. Uh, leverage digital and data to improve your current functions. And I see a huge amount of this going on in the glam sector. Um, create smart museums, integrating sensors and leveraging data uh, like Mona and Tasmania and many others. Uh, use data analytics to understand your collections and holdings and your users. Enable analytics through open access to your own platforms. Uh, seek to collect and preserve digital in addition to your current holdings. But in some ways, everything in that category is what we're doing already is pretty much okay. We can just make it better with digital. Uh, we'll take our existing mandate, our existing uh, principles and direction, we'll adjust it just a little, uh, and that'll be our advantage. I thought there must be a, a third category, which would be fundamentally rethink your role and play a key part in the new data environment. Uh, so this is where customer focus comes in, where design thinking comes in, uh, true innovation, give people what they actually want. Um, really great to, to hear one of my heroes, Brewster Kale, speaking on this side yesterday. Do what's needed. Do what you know the country needs, what you know that they want, and, you know, chances are nobody will complain. Uh, they may be quite pleased with what you provide for them. I think it's a little bit like seeing the world uh, through the eyes of my eight-year-old. Um, her top priorities in life right now are gaming, uh, device and Wi-Fi access, tightly controlled in our household, although I've just about given that one up, um, and privacy. Um, I don't want you to see what I'm doing on the devices, mummy and daddy. Uh, so when we ran the, the test for her on which party uh, she ought to vote for, where she had to have the right to vote, uh, Internet Mana came up at the top. It represents all of her interests. 
Uh, so clearly, uh, the Internet Archive is going to push her buttons. I'm going to show her uh, their Internet Arcade uh, once I can get it working on a, on a tablet. Um, the Internet Archive is an example of transformation of somebody else coming along and replacing a whole lot of things, uh, for example, in the digital preservation space that the institutions that had the role and mandate uh, weren't up for doing in the 1990s and 2000s, uh, showing that you can run a more ambitious business model, take over the world. Um, when I was at an Internet of Things conference in Auckland last week, they were talking about competition. <coughs> what do you do if somebody else comes along and has a better version of your product or service? Well, either you shut up shop and go home, or you buy that service. Um, don't try and improve yours if it's better. Um, just move. So key messages. Uh, the future is now. Um, almost anything that you're thinking is going to happen in 10 or 20 years is already here. Uh, in that sense, data and digital continue to be the new black. Secondly, feelings are mixed. Uh, we need a robust data use ecosystem that includes trust, inclusion and control if we're not going to lose the public's confidence entirely and find that, uh, that we get a backlash and everything shuts down. Um, and third, uh, one of the favourite phrases of John Whitehead, who was chairing the forum, uh, was, let's get on with it, make it work for New Zealand. Uh, let's be clever Kiwis, not possums in the headlights. Uh, don't just focus on the risk, on the challenges, on the reasons not to do something. Focus on the potential and what we can deliver. Uh, uh, we'll just take a couple of questions for Evelyn if anybody, anybody has any burning um, things they'd like to ask. Anything up there? I'm done, yeah. Uh, thanks, Evelyn. Um, it seems to me that whenever I've read the Data Futures uh, information or seen um, presentations on it, that the macro goals and issues are the same. You could replace the word data and put heritage yeah. or record or information or in, in there and mm. you'd still be dealing with those sort of hot topics, those guiding principles and those benefits and opportunities. Mm. Do Is that discussed in the Futures Forum? Is that sort of broad information ecosystem sort of part of the discussions or is it, or is it data specific? Mm. Yeah, I guess to an extent. I mean, I've toyed with it in my own mind. What's the difference between an archive, a record, a publication, information, data? Um, had that conversation particularly on the on the legal side. Um, in the end, I'm not sure that it actually matters. Um, I think with data, the, the key characteristics that push it into new uh, categories of potential is the machine readability, manipulability, um, all of the, the side benefits that come from having things in digital form that, that weren't the primary purpose. You could say, well, that's what an archive's for. It's always been about secondary purposes. Um, just that in here, um, the economic and social potential um, seem to be a little bit more um, tenable, easier to grasp, but it's not something that happens 25 years after the fact. Uh, can I opt out of the IDI? <laughs> Good question. Um, if we knew who you were in there, uh, possibly, uh, but the data is, is fully anonymised, uh, so in IDI we wouldn't be able to say, uh, we wouldn't be able to identify you based on, on your first name, your last name, your date of birth, your unique IDs. Um, those are all stripped out at the point that the data is in there, um, so it becomes essentially a, a different form of aggregate. Uh, I guess the other aspect with IDI is that the data is provided by other administrative parts of government, um, so it depends to what extent you can opt out of those services. Um, crime and protection, not so much. Um, other things to an extent, but certainly one worth testing. Um, you and Rick have both talked about data and privacy and that kind of thing, and I think um, society as a whole is being groomed towards wanting to wear devices and things that are actually giving out our personal information mm. to unknown sources all the time. 
Um, it's heading towards implants now, where you'll actually have implanted devices that send mm -hmm. out information. Do you think that in 30 to 50 years' time, privacy will be obsolete? Like, that, that information is just going to be given from birth almost if you're barcoded at birth or you've got some kind of implant, you're not going to have any control whatsoever where that mm. information is going, who's collecting it. I mean, NSA recently were outed for, you know, spying on all kinds of stuff and things like that. So do you think privacy will even be something that's viable in the future? Mm. That's a fascinating question. So I think if you look at the research, uh, you'd say people's level of concern about privacy is heading up, sort of, in some brackets at least. Youth's concerns in New Zealand have gone up over the last couple of years. Um, people in the South Island have become more concerned over the past couple of years, in particular people in Christchurch. I think anyone who's here from Christchurch would have a fair understanding of why your concerns about privacy might have come up when you're living in a post-earthquake city and you're quite dependent uh, on EQC and other services, so you've fallen into that category that, that needs support. Um, on the other hand, uh, online behaviour shows that people are sharing more and more. Um, I think with privacy, generally, if you took a room like this, I won't do it, um, and asked people how concerned they are and whether they're willing to have things shared for a purpose that's to their benefit, uh, like health, um, probably about 90% in New Zealand would say, oh yeah, no, I'm okay with that. Uh, another 10 uh, percent or 9 uh, might say, well, I'm mildly concerned and I'd really want to know what you're doing. 1% uh, would say, no way, not my stuff, absolutely not, not having it. Uh, and often that 1% or 2% who sit in that category um, have had very negative experiences with use of their information in the past, uh, might have immigrated here from, from a totalitarian state, might have connections in that direction. Um, when we were out talking to people, we found that Māori um, had about 30 or 40% less confidence uh, than most others that we talked to based on negative experiences with how their information's been collected and used over the last century or so. Uh, so I think privacy and your sense of how important it is is very dependent on your personal uh, experience and your level of trust. We're sitting in an environment right now uh, where people's trust is going down um, in other countries based on the actions of, of government and big corporates. Uh, if you're corporate, if you lose somebody's trust, you lose their, uh, their patronage, they can go off and use a different service, um, unless you're Google. Uh, if you're government, uh, they don't get that choice. So from the forum's perspective, would say you need a higher degree of regulation and protection um, where people don't have a choice um, and you need a higher degree of protection uh, where people might not be that aware of what the risks are. Um, so um, having independent regulators is critical. Um, having a, a good up-to-date Privacy Act is critical. Um, those are also things that drive us in terms of being able to progress in New Zealand. So no, privacy is not obsolete. It's just changing. We reached peak, peak Facebook a few years ago, apparently, when all the kids started to shift to Snapchat and Instagram and other things that didn't insist that they use their real name. Uh, it's not that surprising. Well, we might wrap up there in the interest of everyone going to grab a coffee, but please, uh, can we have another round of applause for Evelyn? Yeah. Thanks so much. Yeah.